Hello, my name is Kyle Adamson. I am the pastor here at Songs of Hope Church, and I am so glad you have joined us here today for our online service. I want to let you know a couple of things, that if you have prayer requests or concerns or comments, please put those in the, in the notes section below. We'd love to communicate with you and be praying for you throughout this week. If you would like to give an offering back for all the great things that God has blessed you in your life, there is a link to our online giving below as well. I want to let you know that we meet here every Thursday night at 6.30 p.m. at Songs of Hope Church at 102 South 9th Street in Beach Grove. We would love for you to be our guest here, and we're happy that you joined us online. We hope you enjoy our service today. May God bless you. I want to start off by reading an insert from one of my favorite books. This is from Pastor Kyle Eidelman. And it says, it was a Thursday afternoon, and I was sitting in our sanctuary where 30,000 people would soon be coming to our services. In fact, I think I've got a picture of what his services look, at, look like. So it's a very, very large, just a little bit bigger than what we have here. And he goes, I had no idea what I was going to say to them. He said, I could feel the pressure mounting. I sat there hoping that a sermon would come to mind. I looked around at all the empty seats, hoping for some inspiration. There was just more perspiration. I wiped the sweat off my brow and I looked around. This sermon needs to be great, he said. I told myself, there are some people who only come to church on Christmas and Easter, and we call them Christers. I want to make sure that they all come back. What could I say to get their attention? He goes, can I make more, my message more appealing? Is there something creative I could do? There, could there be a big, uh, a big hit to get people talking? But still, nothing came to him. So there was a Bible on the chair in front of him. He said, I grabbed it, but I couldn't think of a scripture to turn to. He said, I've spent my whole life studying this book, and I couldn't think of one passage that would wow these priesters. I considered using it in the way that I did as a kid, where I would just ask a question, open up the Bible, point somewhere on the page, and whatever it said would answer my question. <laughs> I just shook my head at that one. Finally, a thought crossed my mind. He goes, I wonder what Jesus taught when he had big crowds in front of him. What I ch discovered changed me forever. Not just as a preacher, but as a follower of Christ. He goes, I found that when Jesus had large crowds, he would often preach a message that would more likely drive listeners away rather than encourage them re to return for next week's message. When Easter weekend came, I was so convicted that I stood up and I began my sermon with an apology. I said to the congregation, I I'm sorry. I'm sorry for sometimes selling Jesus cheap and watering down the gospel in hopes that more of you would fill these seats. I followed up with a sermon series entitled Not a Fan, which we did a sermon series of this a few months ago from this book. We went word for word through Luke 9, 23, Jesus' invitation to follow him. And honestly, we had to ask ourselves, am I a fan or am I a follower of Jesus? The dictionary defines fans as enthusiastic admirers, but Jesus was never interested in enthusiastic admirers. He wanted completely committed followers. And we see this, if you've read through the Bible, we see this in the very first book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, where it's recorded that the Sermon on the Mount, he's most widely popular and, and large, large, well, longest sermon. And he often would, would preach on things that were really tough to hear and hard to deal with. In fact, it reminds me, my um, day job is in dermatology pharmaceutical sales. I've done this for almost 20 years. And what do I do in sales? And if anybody's in sales, what do you do? You try to sell your product, so you want to emphasize the good things, but you want to you know, put back the things that may be harmful, that may stop them. At least in my case, I, want, I don't want to talk about what, why you don't want to prescribe my drug. I want, now I want to give the fair warning and tell you the balanced message, but I'm much more likely to emphasize why you want to use this product than why you don't. And I think that's what we often do, and sometimes it's called the prosperity gospel, when we take the Bible and tell you all the good things and not the hard situation it takes to follow Jesus. And in fact, it reminds me that, you know, we've all seen the commercials, right? The TV commercials that have the drug... Uh, uh, all the great things this drug can do for you for whatever instance, but then you have the adverse events. Well, I saw something online that I had to share. We've got to have some fun in church, so let's watch this short clip of a really good uh, commercial. Uh, we're in a meeting between Dave and Andrew Smith. We're in a room. Andrew has just had a bad knee. 
sneezing that makes spring and summer feel gloomy. But now, you can enjoy the outdoors with antihistamine. Antihistamine works with your immune system to fight off harmful allergens, fighting more symptoms and lasting up to 12 hours longer. The chemical compound used in antihistamine is clinically proven to be more effective than leading medicines, so instead of waiting for the season to pass, get out there and live your life. Antihistamine is not for everyone. Consult your doctor before taking antihistamine. Side effects may include, but are not limited to, depression, drowsiness, itchy throat, high blood pressure, low blood sugar, heartburn, bad breath, athlete's foot, acid reflux, gingivitis, upset stomach, blurred vision, cotton mouth, sore throat, sore gums. Your spring and summers don't have to be unbearable. Now you can enjoy them with the people you love. Even more side effects include spontaneous combustion, Down syndrome, bankruptcy, back problems, gout, temporary blindness, heart failure, dyslexia, total shutdown of vital organs. <laughs> Do not consume milk or water while taking antihistamine. People who take antihistamine are likely to develop certain cancers, as well as worsening and even new allergies. Other side effects include paralysis, neural corrosion, seizures, AIDS, lung drowning, kidney failure, testicle erosion. Change in skin pigmentation, dwarfism, moderate to severe Crohn's disease, cardiac arrest, detached retina, loss of teeth, peeling skin, death. Depression, anal leakage, loss of eyelids, sperm deficiency, erectile dysfunction. Stop taking antihistamine if you experience suicidal thoughts. Do not quit or begin smoking while taking antihistamine, nor should you eat grapes after 7 p.m. Do not take any histamine during day. It's time you took control of your life. Don't turn down another invitation. Ask your doctor about any histamine today. So anybody want to take this? I, I, I've heard of where you can get this, the pharmacy. I think my favorite on there, there, there are some good ones, is, is don't eat grapes after 7 p.m. There's something wrong with that. So let's look at what Jesus had to say. Let's look at the, the scripture that, that Kyle uh, you know, emphasized in the beginning remarks of his book. Luke 9, 21 tells us that Jesus strictly warned them not to tell anyone. So just to give you an idea of what was going on, Jesus had been teaching in the temples and had been teaching a lot. There were a lot of religious leaders around, but he was teaching the crowd on what it took to follow him. And he was healing a lot of people, and he, he didn't want them to spread that out yet. He had a time that he knew that his capture and his death and resurrection was bound to happen. But he said in verse 22, he said, The Son of Man must suffer many, suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed on the third day and be raised to life. So once again, you know, we look at what we talked about last week with the, the, um, the disciples who ran away after the death of Christ. And they were so afraid because they thought everything that Jesus said was going to happen, he was going to be our Savior, he was going to be our, our Messiah, and he was the Son of God. It must have been false. We didn't believe it. Yet, right here in so many other places, he's told them this would happen. In verse 23, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, this would have been a complete eye-opener to them because, number one, the cross was the most brutal death you could ever have. It was humiliating. It was incredible pain. And the Romans did, did to show their power and show their strength in this nation, nation. So what Jesus is saying, if you want to follow me, you want to be my follower, what they all did, they all saw his miracles, they all saw his incredible teaching, that, Jesus, I want to follow you. Well, what he's saying is the cost is high. You've got to be willing to deny everything and be able to give your life to me. He goes, Forever, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. He goes, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world let lose their very self? Which, how often do we do that in our, our culture? We're just ready to say whatever it takes to be popular, whatever it takes to make as much money as we can, or to do whatever the glory that we can have in this life, yet we forfeit our soul because it's all about the present. He goes, whoever is ashamed of me and my words as the Son of Man, meaning the Son of God, will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory, 
meaning in his glory at the end of age, and to the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Truly I tell you, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. You see, to us today, a cross is something we wear in our necklaces. It's a symbolic, and there's nothing wrong with that. We want to emphasize, we want to tell people that we're followers of Jesus. We believe in what Jesus does and who he is. But back then, it was just something that was such a negative feeling because they knew what it actually represented. So if you were wondering what it truly means to pick up your cross and follow Jesus, consider these questions. Are you willing to follow Jesus even if it means losing some of your closest friends? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means alienation from some of your family? Are you willing to follow Jesus even if it means the loss of your reputation? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your job? Or are you willing to follow Jesus if it means losing your life? Now, we're in a free country where losing our life or losing our job usually isn't uh, a situation we have to deal with, but there are people all over this world who have to risk this to follow Jesus. And, 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 and these consequences are real for so many people. But notice the questions are phrased, are you willing? Following Jesus doesn't necessarily mean all of these things will happen to you, but are you willing to take up your cross? If there comes a point in your life where you're faced with a choice, Jesus, or the comforts of your life, what are you going to choose? Commitment to Christ means taking up your cross daily, giving up your hopes and dreams, possessions, even your very life, if it need be for the cause of Christ. Only if you are willing to take up your cross can you be called his disciple. But the reward is worth the price. Now you're saying, Kyle, why are you being such a Debbie Downer? We should be celebrating the resurrection of Christ and all the, the promises, and we should be. But we need to know, are we willing to set other things apart? Are we willing to sacrifice things that we enjoy? Now, God wants us to have enjoyable things in this life. He wants us to have joy in this life, but we need to have him as our source. He needs to be what we follow more than anything else. I saw this from author Kerry Newhoff uh, just a couple weeks ago. I thought it was very fitting. He goes, chances are there will be far more people attending our churches this weekend, now he's talking about Easter weekend, than normal. And chances are a good number of them normally don't go to church. What's so sad is that many unchurched people will walk away from the most powerful story ever told unchanged, unaffected, and they won't come back until next year, maybe. Why is that? That's a good question. And the good news is once you know the why, then you can do something about it. You could say that the reason unchurched people leave holidays like Christmas and Easter and Good Friday largely unchanged is because God hasn't opened their hearts or that they're just closed off or that's all up to God anyway. There might be some truth to that. But the reality is that some churches will be more effective at retaining unchurched people because they figured out the greatest challenge with major Christian holidays is familiarity. And I, I think he's exactly right with this. Uh, he says, unchurched people know that Easter and, and Christmas and Good Friday, they know the story. They just don't believe it. Maybe some of you in this room, maybe some people watching online. I think it's very common in our society these days. He says three things that unchurched people think. Number one, while I don't think you can pull people's thought patterns, I think you can pick up on them. And he goes, if I had to guess what unchurched people are thinking when they walk into the room on a major Christian holiday, here's my guess. Number one, he says, there's a sentimentalist. They go, I love this story, and I think they did a great job telling it. Almost. Makes me cry every year. And I will walk away completely unchanged by it. Then you have the never read my Bible, but I'm a spiritual person. It goes, interesting service. They'll say, I get this story. I just have no idea why Jesus came and why he died or why it matters that he rose again. You see, I have my own beliefs. Good for these people. And then we have the cynic that says, yes, I know what this is about. I can't believe I had to come here, but my girlfriend, wife, etc., made me. How long is it going to be before they let me out of here? And I think we see this in churches all the time, but God doesn't care why you're listening to the message. He's glad you're here as you are. The question we need to ask yourself is why is it important to you? Why is it important to me? Uh, Simon Sinek is an author that uh, has an incredible book, you Knowing Your Why, Knowing Why You Do Things and What's the Purpose for It. And a famous quote he has from this is, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. 
in whatever we're motivated to do, why do we do that? And then you'll have your incentive to take action on that. So why do we follow Jesus? Why is it worth it? You know, last week when we left off in the story of, of Good Friday, you know, there were no Christians at that time. There were no church. Church wasn't a thing yet. There was no Bible. They had nothing at the time. And the reason I, I named this, this sermon is from this quote from Bob Goff that says, Darkness fell, his friends scattered, and hope seemed lost. Kevin discarded, started, heaven just started counting to three. He knew, God knew what was coming. So let's read briefly the story from John 20. We're going to look at John 20, 1 through 23. John, the disciple of Jesus, really close in his gospel, his story of, the, of being around Jesus is all about the miracles and the person of who Jesus was here on earth. And so verse 1 of chapter 20 says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went into the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from, from the entrance. She came up running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. So John here is talking about himself when he says, the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. So, so realize, John is writing this himself, so he's saying, Jesus loved me. I want to make sure you know that. So she came running to them because she can't believe that Jesus uh, isn't there. And she goes, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. Can you believe this? She goes, I don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple, meaning John himself, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Now, this doesn't say this in any other of the four uh, stories of Jesus in the other Gospels. I guess if you're writing a story about yourself and you beat somebody in a foot race, why not put it in there? Now, I, I believe John was quite a bit younger at the time, so that may have had something to do with it. So it said, uh, Peter reached the tomb first, or, or John reached it first, and then Peter reached the tomb. He bent down and looked into the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. You see, John didn't go in right away. Then Simon Peter came along behind him, went straight into the tomb, and he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separated from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, meaning himself, he also went inside, and he saw, and he believed. You see, and he put in parentheses, they still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. He was part of his plan the entire time. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Jesus, or I'm sorry, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. She was devastated. Why would somebody take the body of Jesus, who had been brutally murdered, off the cross? Everyone saw him die. Why would they steal his body, she's wondering. Well, she bent over to look in the tomb and saw two angels in white seated there where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Now, two other Gospels say that these uh, angels were as white as lightning. Can you imagine the, the awe of this, of seeing these angels, white as lightning? They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. I don't know where they, are put, where they put him. And at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there but she didn't realize who it was. He asked her, woman, woman, why are you crying? Why, or who is it that you're looking for? And thinking that he was the gardener, so I wonder what he looked like, that she thought he was the guy putting out the flowers in the front, but thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will go meet him. I'll go get it. No matter what happened, I don't care why. I just want to make sure his body is taken care of. Here again, she could not fathom that he actually rose from the dead and is living. Who does that, especially after what he endured? Jesus said to her, Mary. I love how this is said because when she speaks, or when he speaks her name, she recognizes that Jesus is there. And this is all to me because Jesus knows each one of us individually so well, knows everything about us, and he'll call us out by name, and we need to listen. She turned around to him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them that I am ascended to the Father and, and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. She goes, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that all the things that had happened to her. She couldn't believe it. She was so excited. And on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for the fear of the Jewish leaders, 
You see, remember, they have the doors locked because they felt like Jesus was dead. The Roman soldiers were going to come to arrest them next. They were the followers. They're going to try to arrest them. Are they going to try to kill them? They didn't know what was going to happen. Well, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After, th after this, he showed them his hands and his side where the scars were, where the nails went in, and where the sword went in. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am now sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. You see, he's given them their spirit, which he's given to all of us who believe and follow Jesus. You see, the free gift of grace and eternal life is for anybody at any time. It's for each one of us right now. Whether you've given your life to him, whether you follow him or not, the fact that you're listening to this message, you hear about the resurrection, and later on, we learn that not only was he resurrected, he was resurrected and seen in front of almost 500 people. The Gospels were written within 50 years of the event happening because they wanted to share. The God, all, the, all the writers the, the, or all the disciples who were afraid of their lives when Jesus died were willing to risk their lives and were martyred because once they saw that Jesus actually did what he was going to do, what he said he was going to do, they said, I don't care what happens to me on this earth because I know he is the son of God and we have hope for eternal life because of this. But this is the why we follow him. See, there's both grace and truth in Jesus. We talk about the grace, we talk about the un unending love that God has for us, which he does. But there's also truth that we have to follow him and follow his commandments. We cannot live this life the way that we desire in all of our uh, wants and needs and, and assume that God loves us so much that he'll make an exception for our life or lifestyle and we can do whatever we want with that beyond his commands. You see, we get to choose whether we follow him or not. This is what complete agape love is. He doesn't force us to love him as much as he wants us with him. We're all created in God's image as much as he wants us with him in heaven eternally. It's our choice. We have to make that choice. There are a lot of people who are going to say that's not fair. I want to get to God the way I feel we should get to God. Maybe it's through the stars or through our horoscope. Maybe it's through a different religion. Why do I have to go through Jesus? Well, I guess if you have your own universe and creation, then you can do it the way you want, but we're in God's creation. This is how he designed, he designed it for our purpose and our joy. And that's where we believe in his son, Jesus. He was the ultimate sacrifice for each one of us. <laughs> I saw this sign and, and there's a little bit of truth in it. The fact that there's a highway to hell and a stairway to heaven says a lot about anticipated traffic numbers. You know, Jesus talked about there's a wide road that leads to destruction, a narrow road that leads to eternity with God. Because a lot of people aren't going to make the sacrifices that it takes to be with God. But anything worth living, anything that's worth the incredible great reward takes sacrifice. Romans 8, and this is where we get our promise. Paul tells the, the churches in Rome, in Romans 8, 38, he goes, for I am convinced, I am sure of this, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present or the future, any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is through Christ Jesus, our Lord, because he is risen. And that is where we have our promise for eternal life. He is risen. Will you say that with me? He is risen. Let's pray. God, I thank you for sacrificing your son for us. We, none of us would have a, a chance to be with a perfect God forever without this or to have you with us to help us do this life as difficult as it may seem sometimes. I thank you for that gift that everybody has. I just pray today that I stop trying to make everything just perfect, that, that people, uh, just give me the, the wisdom to know how to talk to people, to love them no matter what they believe or where they're at, to share the truth of Jesus. I just pray that you, you move in the hearts of those who don't know Jesus tonight, that they want to give their lives to you and want to make that ultimate choice to live for you. 
It's so worth it. It's the best choice most of us have ever made. And I want everyone to have this joy. Father, this is my prayer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand for our final song. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful sin. Jesus Christ, my living God. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation. Oh,
And next week, if you come back, you'll be privileged to hear our drummer, Chris, giving a sermon. I have no idea what he's going to preach, but if you've heard him drum, it's going to be outstanding. I mean, anytime a drummer can get up and preach, that's great. It's a little selfish. I've been a long-time drummer. Um, so I, I hope you come back next week. So what do we do with this? First of all, don't forget, stay for at least a little bit after the fellowship. we got some free pizza and cookies and drinks in the back. But we know he's risen. We know he's given his life. What are we going to do with that? What's your next step? Do you feel like you want to give your life to Christ? Do you feel like maybe you have given your life to Christ and you want to get baptized and be born again and shown in front of your family and friends you've done that? Maybe you want to get involved with the church and serve to help others. Whatever it is, let us help you. Let us know how we can help you take that next step in your faith journey. Go in peace in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.